Good morning, everybody. So today is our first instructional video. I'm gonna give you a few minutes to get your supplies together. What we are gonna be using first is we're going to need our Ready Common Core book. You're gonna take out your Ready Common Core book and meet me back here. And you can just press pause while you're getting it. And I'll be right here waiting for you. Okay, hey guys, so you're gonna open up to page 176 and using this video is all new to me, so I've been learning this. So it's gonna be a little jumbly this first day, but hopefully it'll flow a little more smoothly. You're opening up to page 176, and this week we're gonna be talking about inferences. So this is lesson 12, and it is about supporting inferences about literary texts. So let's see if I can get a pen on here. Okay, so this is this word inferences. We've talked a bit about this in class um, and it's kind of like making a guess, but it's a smart guess. You're using actual clues while you're figuring something out. So the learning target is we're going to use story details and examples to explain what the story says and to support inferences you make. Let's see if I can make this a little bit smaller. Make it red. Can you see this better? Okay, there we go. All right, and okay, so I'm gonna read this to you guys. You guys can follow along while I'm reading. So an inference is a reasonable guess you figured out based on what you already know and the details of what you see or read. When you make an inference, be sure you can support it with evidence or details and examples given in the text. You're gonna be doing this this afternoon um, with the story that we're reading, which is Bud Not Buddy. So you're gonna be coming up with inferences using details from the story and examples from the story. So readers make inferences to figure out what a story does not say directly. Evidence from a text can often help you understand something that an author hints at but does not state directly. So look at the cartoon below. What inferences can you make about the girl? Which details help you figure out her feelings? So if we take a look at this gal down here, I don't know how to get that to scroll up. I'll just make it a little smaller. Okay, so I'm gonna just give you a second to look at this picture. Notice the, all the writing on here and notice what's happening. Where is she, what is she doing? Yes, so. This little gal here, she is at the movies. Looks like Shelmet movie theater, which is pretty cool. Um, what time is it? Jordan? Yes. It's 1 p.m. Good job, Jordan. And what is she saying? Can you read this, Marquise? Because I'm so excited to finally see this movie. Everyone says it's so good. So at the beginning, they kind of tell us. They tell us what she's doing. She's really excited. And she, she's got a little thought bubble here, so she's not talking to herself at the movie theater, but the author is telling us what she's thinking. So she's excited to see this movie. She's got popcorn that's overflowing. What does that tell you about that popcorn? Is that new popcorn or old popcorn? Has she been sitting there a while? So this, because this is full popcorn, I'm gonna guess that she just went to the concession stand and got the popcorn, and now she just sat down. She's ready to watch the movie. I'm gonna look at my second picture here, following the arrow. I see this gal is sitting there and the time has changed. It went from one o'clock and now it is, it's 1.45. So 45 minutes has gone by. You can see a little bit less popcorn is there. So we see that time has passed. But if you look at what happened to her face, she went from kind of smiling with her eyes wide open and now, She's not looking so happy. Her eyes are half closed. She's looking at her watch and it looks like she's possibly yawning. So the author doesn't tell me anything about that, but I can kind of figure out how she's feeling. And probably a lot of you guys have been sleeping in during this little time off from school and you might have the same look on your face right now. And even though I can't hear what she's thinking or talk to this gal, I can probably guess that she's a little tired, maybe a little bored. And now I'm gonna to go to the next one, see what happens to her there. This is gonna be a little tricky. So in her last little picture, this gal, her popcorn has spilled, which is never a good sign. 
and she's got her eyes closed. She's slumped down in her chair and she's got all these Z's. And these Z's, I'm sure you know what those mean. That means that she fell asleep. So the author doesn't tell us what happened here, but we know at the beginning of this little cartoon, she's at a movie theater and she's really excited to see a movie. And when by the end of it, she's asleep and she even spilled her popcorn. So just an hour later, that's what happened. So what inference can you make? What can you figure out? Use and clues from the story. What can you figure out happened during this time period from one o'clock to 2.15, what happened to this character? I'm gonna press pause and I'm gonna give you a second in your Ready Common Core book to at the bottom here, I want you to jot down what do you think happened? You're like a detective. Okay, so I'm gonna press pause and I'm gonna to try to. Okay guys, so you have your inference that you made. Now I want you to turn to page 177. Okay, 177 in your book, and I have it up on my screen. We're gonna do this together. So this is the thinking part. It says, what have you learned about using details to make inferences? Consider what happens in the cartoon. How does the girl eventually feel about the movie? Use what you figured out about the girl to complete the inference chart below. Make inferences based on the details in the cartoon and what you already know. So this is, this is the important part. It has to be based on this cartoon or when we're talking about stories, it has to be from details in the story. It's not gonna be some random idea you have. It has to have some basis. I'm gonna see if I can write right here. And my husband's here, so hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. So I had to move my office into my room, so I'm probably gonna have a little bit of traffic, people coming in and out of the room. I'm sure you guys are doing the same thing at home. So you can infer that we have very limited space here and a lot of people. But what we're gonna infer about this gal. So this gal is at the movies. I wanna start the story, where was she? Let's see if I'm able to type on here. Okay guys, I think I have this figured out now. I hopefully will be able to type on this. So what the cartoon shows in the beginning of the story is that we see a young girl at the movies sitting up with full popcorn, smiling. Um, that tells us, that just explains what we saw. That's some information from the story. And then what I already know is that I know that people often look forward to seeing a new movie, especially if they've heard good things about it. So my inference is, well, if I already know that people like new movies and that this gal is sitting up like this, I can infer that she is excited to see this new movie. So the young girl is excited to see the movie. So that's how this starts. Now in the middle of the picture, we see the little gal and she's, I don't remember what she was doing. She's kind of slumped down a little bit and she's looking at her watch. Um, and I'm gonna write that down right here. So I'm gonna press pause for a second while I figure out how to type again. Okay, so we're going to continue with our inference. So in the middle thing, in the middle cartoon, it says the girl is, or you can see that the girl is yawning and she's looking at her watch and some of her popcorn has been eaten. Well, what I already know about that is that I know when I'm looking at my watch or I'm yawning, that means that I am bored, right? And that's from my own experience, I know that. I'm trying to write with a very funny pen. It's not that easy. So you can infer that I am new at this. Okay, so we know that if you're looking at your watch or you're yawning, you're probably bored. So what is the inference I can make? I see her behavior, I use what I know. What can I infer then about what's going on in this story? I'm gonna press pause and I want you to fill in this last little piece here. 
Maybe I'm not. So I can infer that the girl is bored at the new movie. And I know that because I know that's how I look when I'm bored. Okay, so now we're gonna go, this is our last little picture in it. And the last picture in that cartoon was that the girl was sitting there and she actually had knocked over her popcorn, which is not cool. And she is asleep. <laughs> So I'm gonna write down my facts here that I see. The girl is asleep. Her popcorn has spilled. And an hour has passed. And I know that because they do show a clock there. They show the time on that cartoon. So seeing what I know about the story, and what I know, if I spill my popcorn and my eyes are closed, that's my experience, is that if I'm really bored, I'll fall asleep. That's from my experience, I know that. So what can I infer about this gal and her movie? Well, I think we all know what happened there. But based on what I know and based on what she's doing, the movie, the girl thought the movie was boring. Big old boring. So I used my clues that I saw in the story, what I already know, and I came up with my inference. So it's, it's just a guess, but it's using information that you know from the story as well. So did you and your partner write the same thing in what I know column? So did you come up with the same inferences? How did that information affect what you wrote and what the cartoon shows column? How did the evidence help you make that inference? So how did this evidence right here help you come up with that inference? That's what we're really gonna be looking at and especially when we're doing our novel study, you're gonna be using details and examples from the text to back up your inference. These are some of the words that you wanna be focusing on while you're writing. So you're gonna use these words to talk about the text. You're gonna use inference, which is that educated guess, examples, details, and evidence. Evidence, evidence, evidence. We know that's a big thing in fourth grade and all throughout life. Everything you say, you have to back it up with evidence. I'm gonna pause there and what I want you to do is to get out your bud versus buddy. So take out this book. If you don't have this book, what you can do is you can get it through our classroom. So our Google Classroom has it and I put it up on our class website as well so you can get it there. I do have it read aloud there, so I'm gonna press pause and show you how to get to that spot. I can, I don't know how to get out of this thing. Wait, I think I figured it out. Hold on, kitties. Stop share. Pause recording. Okay guys, so go back to your Clever screen and we're gonna pull up Bud Not Buddy. So once you go to Clever, you can go to Google Classroom. Let's see if I can open my Google Classroom. Once I go to Google Classroom, this is logged into my person. We'll go under your ELA tab, and it's got a link to our website right there. So once we get on our class website, we can find it pretty easily. This is our class website. You go under the ELA tab, it's gonna have our book club right there. And this is the book we're gonna be reading. This is Bud, Not Buddy. And I read aloud each of these chapters for you. What we're gonna focus on today is chapter one. And what you can do is you can read it on your own or you can follow along here. I'm not gonna play that right now because it's already right here, but I'm gonna give you guys, you can press pause to my talking right now, go ahead and read the video, and then I'm gonna show you our assignment for writing. Let's see if this will pop open. Just to show. Bud, not Buddy, by Christopher Paul Curtis. See, that's me talking. So you get to listen to me reading it, or you can read it on your own. Everybody has a copy of this. So press pause in this video, read chapter one, and then we're going to meet back here in however long it takes you to read it, okay? All right. Okay, hi, guys. So hopefully you had a chance to read chapter one or listen to me read chapter one. 
how do you like it? It's, I like this story a lot. I think it's really interesting. And it's a historical fiction book. So we've been reading a lot of historical fiction. And you guys know that's my favorite genre of writing. Um, and it's set during the Great Depression, which we will be talking about in social studies as well. So we have this little boy buddy. Um, and we're going to talk about how, let me get you your assignment. And then we'll talk about how to answer it. So if you go to your Google Classroom and you open up to your classes, when you get there, you're going to see these three pages. You'll see math class, ELA, and then there's just a general page. You don't have to worry about this too much. In your ELA, you go here and it's got Jillian Dresser, that's me, posted a new question. I'm gonna click on that and it opens it up right here. After reading chapter one in Bud Not Buddy, what can you infer about Bud's feelings towards his dad? Use details and examples from the story to prove your point. So I wanna figure out what can I infer about Bud's feelings towards his dad. And what I did is I made a chart just like we saw with Ready Common Core. I'm gonna to try to show it to you. Hopefully it works, we'll see what happens. This is the chart that I made. So I'm gonna collect evidence from the story that tells me about how Bud feels towards his father I'm gonna use my experience about what I know that's similar to what he's doing in this story. And then I'm gonna make an inference of feelings towards his dad. So the first thing I want you guys to do is I want you to copy down a similar chart like this. You can do it on, if you have a whiteboard, that'd be fantastic. If you have your notebook, just take that out and go ahead and copy this. So you have three different columns. You have an evidence from the story column. You have an experience column and then you have an inference column. First, so for the evidence from the story, we're trying to figure out how he feels about his father. And we don't even know his father yet because his father hasn't spoken, we haven't met his father, but he kind of has said a few things about his father. So some of the few things, I want you to go back to the story and think about what did he mention about his father? Just think about that for a second and jot down some of the things that he mentioned about his father in your chart. I'm going to give you a second to do that, and then I'm going to call on someone to give me their example. Okay, guys, so hopefully you came up with some good examples. I'm going to make this screen a bit bigger so you can see what I came up with and see if you have similar things. So we wanted to find evidence from the story of how he felt towards his dad. I came up with three examples. I'm really hoping that this shows up correctly on your screen and is not a mirror image. But what I looked for in the story is evidence of how he felt towards his dad or any interaction he had with his dad. And I know just from the beginning of the story that he's living in a foster home. So he's in a foster home, he's not living with his dad. And my experience with that, and you guys can think about this too, is. If somebody's living in a foster home and they're not with their dad, there's somebody going by with some very loud music. I don't know if you can hear that. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. There's like a parade or something outside. I'm sorry, we don't have that in our classroom. Just pretend that didn't happen. So we want to think about our dad. Um, Thing about this kid he's in foster care and he's not living with his dad so i i know from experience that if a child is not living with their dad maybe their parents were divorced or the dad died that's my experience that's what i know about usually if the child is living in a foster home or is not with his dad it's either because the dad was divorced from mom or the dad died. And I don't know yet, I can infer that one of these things happened. So I can say that, well, maybe Bud's dad died. The thing with inferences that you wanna keep in mind is they're not always true. So if you assume something, it's not always gonna be exactly right but at least you're basing it on the clues from the story. So I don't know yet, maybe his dad didn't die or maybe his dad, we don't know yet, but what I can guess, because I know that that's usually what happens if 
the kid is not living with their dad, the dad is somewhere else. The second thing I noticed from the story is that he sees a flyer that has his dad in it. And this flyer, um, he saves this flyer with them. It's got a picture of someone and he doesn't even know if the guy in the picture is his dad, but I know that he's got that flyer and then he keeps looking at that flyer. So he's folded it and unfolded it and folded it and unfolded it. And that, if I'm holding onto something and I keep looking at it over and over and over, my experience, something like that, that I keep holding on to, it's something that's really, really important to me. And I hold on to all cards and letters. I, that kind of stuff is really sentimental. It's really important. So his dad, is missed. I can tell you when I, my dad sends me pictures and letters, I have a stack of them. He likes to write a lot of letters and I hold on to every one of them. And that's because it's important to me. And to this little boy, he's holding on to all these letters and he keeps looking at it. And in my experience, that means that his dad's really important and that he really misses his dad. That's my experience, so I'm guessing Maybe that's his experience. So the inference I can make is that Bud probably misses having a dad. And I made that inference because I know in my experience, I hold on to things because I miss my dad. And in the story, he was holding on to it. So maybe he's having the same experience. That's the inference. What you guys are going to do is you're going to write your own paragraph about that. Why don't you coming up with your own details from the story? Now, I did chapter one. You can use chapters one, two, three, or four from Bud Not Buddy to answer this question. I don't want it to look the same as me. I want you to have, obviously, your own ideas. You've got your own brains in there. So come up with your own ideas. Come up with your own list of evidence, list of your experiences of what you know about how people feel towards their dads and then come up with an inference about how Bud probably is feeling towards his dad. Can you see Elliot in the background? Elliot, say hi. He's really into inferencing. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna press pause. What I want you to do is to go ahead and open up your Google Classroom. See if I can do this with you. And you guys would just go and write this answer right on there, okay? When you write it, I'm gonna be able to respond back to what you write and give you any feedback. And on Monday, we're gonna revisit this question and share out some answers. What I want you to do now is after you've written that, I want you to take out the last thing we're gonna do for ELA today, and that is going to be your grammar and writing practice. So we're gonna go on to week seven. I'm gonna put this aside and I'm gonna look at some grammar practice. You guys know that this is a big deal for me. I, I love grammar <laughs> and I love learning about how to write sentences correctly. So we're focusing on a simple subject. These are the parts of speech we're doing this week. We wanna know who or what is doing or being. And the simple predicate, this is the verb that shows what the subject is being or doing. So you capitalize, you capitalize relatives' names when used as proper nouns. If you're saying aunt to Margaret, aunt would be capitalized as well as Margaret. And then for punctuation, you put commas between longer series of words. I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a second. So today is Monday. Let's see if I can get this guy down. I'm gonna open up my aunt tape, don't disappear on me. Okay, so labeling the parts of speech, This says the sun rises and sets each day. So the simple subject here is who or what is doing or being the verb. So who is doing something or what is doing something? This is what's doing something, the sun. So I'm gonna circle the sun. The sun is my simple subject. That is what is doing something. And then the question is verbs that show what the subject is being or doing. So I'm gonna circle those as well. So the sun is rising and setting and that's it this is my subject and this is my predicate 
And for this one, we're just doing the simple predicate. So it's just the actual word. It's not this whole sentence. It's just the actual verbs there. Now I'm going to correct these sentences down here. I'm looking for capitalization here. So obviously I know that I have to start with cap capital letter at the beginning of my sentence. I already know that. That's, I mean, come on, we know this. So a Bengal tiger, I'm saying it wrong, but that's okay. A Bengal tiger, a spider monkey, and a spotted hyena live at Brookfield Zoo. Well, what comes at the end of our sentence? We already know this one. Put a period here. Now I know that I'm gonna be looking for these things. I wanna capitalize relatives' names when used as proper nouns. And I'm gonna put commas between longer series of words. So I don't have any relatives in here. I'm not related to a spider monkey or a spotted hyena. So I'm not gonna worry about this capitalization rule for this sentence, but I do wanna worry about these commas. So I'm gonna put commas between longer series of words. This is Bengal tiger, a spider monkey, and a spotted hyena live at Brookfield Zoo. I'm gonna put commas between these two things. So this is a type of tiger. I'm gonna put a comma after him. This is a type of monkey, is a spider monkey. I'm gonna put a comma after him. And then it says, and a spotted hyena live at Brookfield Zoo. And I don't need to put it after spotted hyena because that's just the rest of the sentence. I'm not listing anything else after that. So Bengal tiger, a spider monkey, and a spotted hyena live at Brookfield Zoo. I don't know what Brookfield is, so I'm gonna assume that that's the name of a place and I'm gonna capitalize that so it's a big fat. B and zoo is actually part of that name. It's not just Brookfield, it's a Brookfield Zoo. So I have to capitalize that because it is the name of a place. And now I'm down here for my last sentence. This is Aunt Sally and Uncle Ray live at 3295 Evergreen Drive, Tucson, Arizona. So what I wanna do is obviously capitalize my first letter. And this is actually Aunt Sally. So this does follow that rule. If we have capitalizing a relative's name, I capitalized Aunt. And it's not just Aunt, it's Aunt Sally. So capitalize Aunt Sally. And then Uncle Ray, I'm gonna capitalize Uncle, because it's being used like his name. It's just like Mr. Ray, because you're calling Uncle Ray. Capitalize the Uncle, capitalize the Ray. Uncle, Aunt Sally and Uncle Ray live at 3295 Evergreen Drive, Tucson, Arizona. And I know I have to put a period at the end. That's just a statement. This might be a little bit trickier figuring out what the street is and what the city and state are. You guys obviously know Arizona is the state, so we're going to capitalize that. It's the name of the state. And you can probably guess if you don't know that Tucson is a city in that state. Just like New Orleans is a city in Louisiana, Tucson is a city in that state. Does anyone know what you put between the city and the state? Sassia. Good job. Yeah, you put a comma. Someone was listening. Good. Now what else do I have to do? Aunt Sally and Uncle Ray live at 3295 Evergreen Drive. Good job. Yes, Madison, you have to capitalize that E because that is the name of the street. And drive because that's also part of the name of that street. It's Evergreen Drive. There's one last piece of punctuation that has to go in this sentence. I want you to read through this again and I'm going to call on whoever's raising their hand. Aunt Sally and Uncle Ray live at 3295 Evergreen Drive, Tucson, Arizona. Devon. Okay, Devon, where do you think, what should we put here? A comma, yes, where? Good, between Drive and Tucson, excellent. All right, good job. So you guys are going to go ahead and do the next couple pages here. And um, let me see if I can erase all of this, clear all my drawings. You're gonna do Tuesday, and then guess what you're doing after that? Yes, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Friday is gonna be like your little quiz. I do want you guys to try to do this. And if you put it on Google Classroom, you just rewrite these sentences. I'm gonna grade it and give it back to you. And it's not a grade grade, but I'll tell you how you did on it, okay? When you guys are writing your answer about Bud versus Buddy, make sure you follow these rules. You capitalize Bud, uh, capitalize the name of the story for sure, but also, when you're writing series of things, you're gonna put commas in between each of those. 
And that's about it. So hopefully I'll have all the kinks worked out and next time I am using this, this video will be a little bit clearer. We'll be able to <laughs> flow through it more smoothly. Um, but if you guys have any questions or need anything, feel free to write to me on Google Classroom or you can always call or text, okay? Have a great week. Let's see if I can do this. All right, bye.